All right. So last night we had the third official GOP primary debate. Um, and I unfortunately had to watch it. I don't know if you guys watched it, but uh, part of my job. So, uh, I, you know, took one for the team, I guess. And there's not many clips that I would feel the need to show you guys. It wasn't that interesting, especially because you didn't have Donald Trump on stage. He's a coward in the same way that Joe Biden is a coward, won't participate in the primary uh, debates. And so, uh, you know, you basically have the second stringers here who are getting up on stage and yelling at each other and trying to compete for who wants to start more wars than the other one. And uh, so I'm not going to show you guys like a full highlight reel or anything, but there was some uh, there was some interesting stuff when they discussed Israel and Gaza and Iran and all of the rest of that. So I just want to watch this quick clip here that was posted by I'm Really Important, um, and then we'll circle back around to I'm Really Important's take here on uh, whether or not there's there's much of a difference between Joe Biden and the rest of these Republicans when it comes to Israel and Gaza, and then I'm also going to give you guys a bunch of more updates on the latest of what Joe Biden is saying in regards to a ceasefire and humanitarian pause and all of the uh, destruction that we have seen over the last couple of days. So let's go ahead and check in with the uh, Republican ghouls. As President of the United States, what would you be urging Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to do at this moment? Governor DeSantis. I would be telling Bibi, finish the job once and for all with these butchers, Hamas. The first thing I said to him when it happened was I said, finish them. Finish them. I would tell him to smoke those terrorists on his southern border, and then I'll tell him as President of the United States, I'll be smoking the terrorists on our southern border. If you want to stop the 40-plus attacks on military personnel in the Middle East, you have to strike in Iran. As President of the United States... Okay, so, um, you know, basically the gist of it is they say, you know, finish them off, level Gaza, who gives a shit, do whatever you need to do. That was basically the gist of this debate when it came to Israel and Gaza. Um, and of course, you have guys like Tim Scott and Nikki Haley who also were calling to go to war with Iran directly, like actually striking Iran starting World War Three. Okay, so obviously, I mean, I think a lot of these people are just outwardly bloodthirsty. They also wanted to go, a few of them, to uh, war with Mexico, as Vivek was just saying there, down at the southern border. We're going to militarize it. We're going to go to war with the cartels. Um, you also had some of them talking about and seemingly inevitable from their perspective war with China. Um, and uh, a couple other countries were, were sprinkled in there, okay? So, you know, obviously... I think these people are absolute monsters. Uh, I think if any of them were to get elected, including Trump, we'd probably end up in a number of different wars almost immediately based on their rhetoric, based on the policies that they've laid out. Um, and so obviously I think they're a completely, you know, unmitigated disaster. Now we circle back around to this, right? Here from I'm Really Important. Gaza wouldn't exist right now if the GOP were in control. People should be thankful that we have President Biden in charge. Okay, so obviously... There are some differences between Republicans and Democrats on any given policy, right? We could talk about, you know, the living wage or, or minimum wage. We could talk about climate change, right? There are, like, some differences between them, right? On some issues, the daylight is very small. On some issues, it's a little bit larger, you know, et cetera, et cetera. When it comes to this issue, okay, there is nothing that any of them just said that is materially different than Joe Biden's policy right now. It may be rhetorically different. Biden may come out and finger wag about, you know, uh, they need to be following in accordance with uh, international uh, laws of war, right? Or he may come out and say, well, we should have a humanitarian pause, whatever the fuck that means, right? He may had add some, some rhetorical flourish to his endorsement of Benjamin Netanyahu's uh, uh, policies right now and his goals in Gaza. But the dead Palestinians are still dead, right? The, uh, the humanitarian situation in Gaza is still the same, all right? The genocidal intent, I think, from the position of Israel is still exactly the same. The facts on the ground aren't really changing between what these Republicans just said in this debate versus what Joe Biden is doing right now. And so it's just one of those issues where you do see a, a broad bipartisan consensus in allowing Israel to do whatever the fuck they want to do. The weapon shipments, that's still the same. We're still sending them billions of dollars in aid. We just passed another $14 billion to send over in these, uh, you know, weapons packages for them to go drop on Palestinian kids in Gaza. So that's really not much of a difference. And just to back that up here a little bit, Biden was recently asked, what are the prospects of a Gaza ceasefire? This is what he said. No possibility. 
No possibility. So again, an endorsement of what Benjamin Netanyahu is doing, not just with the airstrikes and the bombing campaign, where as a reminder, I mean, there was literally a one week period so far during this a little bit over a month now that they've been bombing Gaza, where they dropped more bombs and ammunition on the Gaza Strip than we did in the heaviest bombardment uh, year in Afghanistan. Okay, and we're talking about an area that is a tiny minuscule fraction of the size of Afghanistan, one of the most densely populated places on earth where half the population are children, and Israel dropped more bombs in one week than the United States did in the heaviest year of bombardment in Afghanistan. Just to give you a picture of the scale there, I mean, the latest uh, death toll that I've seen estimated on the low end is at, at about like 10 to 11,000 right now over 4,500 of them being children. How many of them have been Hamas? I've seen estimates that go as high as like 60 Hamas members that have been confirmed killed. So, I mean, I don't know. You guys tell me. We're, we're talking about, as of what we have confirmed right now, a ratio, a percentage of at least over 90, if we're being generous, about 90% civilians to, uh, you know, Hamas members, right? So, I mean, again, this, this idea that, like, oh, they're engaging in a targeted bombing campaign against Hamas, they're just trying to remove Hamas from power, it doesn't look like that, okay? When you're killing 90% civilians... Are we really supposed to believe that you're taking every measurable, you know, effort you possibly can to avoid civilian casualties? No, it looks like you're targeting the civilians, or at the very least, you don't give a shit about the dead civilians. And this is why we see so many Israeli politicians and U.S. politicians turning around and putting all of that blame on Hamas. Oh, Hamas is forcing people to stay in their homes after we, we told them to leave, as if it's possible to just completely transplant over a million people who live in the north of Gaza to the south of Gaza, where, oh, by the way, you're still bombing in the south of Gaza as well. I mean, there's there's all of these narratives. Oh, the human shields, right? It's all because Hamas is using them as human shields. So if there's a hospital that's full of thousands and thousands of patients and people taking refuge there from your other bombs that you're dropping on their houses, okay, and refugee camps and, and mosques and et cetera, et cetera. So if there's thousands of people taking shelter and treatment in a hospital and you say, well, there was a tunnel underneath that hospital, right? Then that gives you a right to go in and blow up everybody in the hospital. OK, that's the that's the logic of Israel, which is not only it's it's wrong in the sense that they don't ever provide any evidence that there was a Hamas tunnel or weapons storage facility or, you know, a militant or anything in any of these given locations. But it's also nonsensical because that's not how international law fucking works. I mean, obviously, international law is toothless and it's feckless and it, you know, because of the United States being the most powerful country in the world, giving cover to Israel, it doesn't have any real consequences for them if they don't follow in accordance with international law. But if you actually look at the law, you have to take into account civilian casualties. If there's some Hamas militant in any given location, or a tunnel network or a, a, a weapon, okay, that does not give you the right to just massacre as many civilians as you want. That's not how this shit works. But apparently the Biden administration has a different take on it. They said here uh, that there is essentially no red lines for Israel. Let's watch this John Kirby clip here. There's the same guy as a reminder who was crying over Russia, Russians' war crimes in Ukraine and the dead civilians in Ukraine during that invasion. He, he was crying on the podium for those innocent Ukrainian civilians. And then when he was asked about the innocent civilians dying in Gaza, he turned around and said, well, war is bloody. What are you going to do? That's part of war. So let's go ahead and hear this about the red lines. Is that still the case that the administration has no red lines? <laughs> that is still the case. In late October, you had referred to the fact that the administration is not drawing any red lines for Israel. As the death toll for civilians in the Gaza Strip has gone up, I wanted to ensure, is that still the case that the administration has no red lines? <laughs> that is still the case. Okay, so it's still the case. There's no red lines. There's literally no amount of civilians that can be massacred by Israel for, for them to turn around and say, okay, that's a little bit too much. And I also want to touch on something. I mentioned this in, in one of my recent videos as well. Now, a lot of this is still up in the air. We don't have 100% of, of an accurate breakdown from the government of Israel or what they're claiming happened on October 7th. And I think that part of that is also questionable as well. I think they should have released a lot of the exact breakdowns on, well, how many civilians were killed? What were the names of those civilians? How many of them were, were military targets? Because Hamas did kill innocent civilians as well as targeting military installations, right? Let's get a full breakdown of exactly what happened. Not to downplay what Hamas did, not to say that they're innocent or anything like that, but just to get an accurate picture of what happened on that day. And we did just get from the government of Israel a list of the names of the 1,400 people that they say were killed on October 7th. And some people were doing breakdowns looking at the names that Israel posted themselves, and you see a lot of sergeant and commander and lieutenant, etc., on that list. And we could very well get to the end of this 
when we figure out all of the exact details of the October 7th uh, attack and all of the exact details of Israel's bombing in Gaza since October 7th going on over a month now, and we could very well get to the end of this and come to the realization that Israel is not only killing, obviously, a, a, a larger amount of civilians in a total sense, in a total number, that's indisputable, but also as a percentage, okay? Because, you know, according to what we know based on those names that they released, it does look like a massive bulk of the people who were killed on October 7th were military officials, were soldiers who were in some of the barracks that were attacked and taken over by Hamas on that day. And we also don't know how many civilians, because we also know that this happened as well, we don't know how many civilians were killed by Israel when they were responding to the Hamas attack. We know that Israel was firing their own tank shells, according to the commanders who were on the ground at the time, at some of the houses in the Israeli kibbutz, where there were Hamas fighters and there were also Israeli civilians. And they made this calculation that we're just going to start firing tank shells at some of these houses, regardless of if we end up, you know, accidentally, I guess, if you want to use that word, you know, killing some of our own citizens to take out the Hamas guys. So we don't know the full breakdown on how any of this shaked out. But just the reason that I bring this up is not to, to praise Hamas, obviously, is not to downplay that they did kill civilians, but it's just to distinguish the language, the rhetoric that we hear from U.S. politicians about what happened on October 7th. This is the worst terrorist attack in Israel's history. This was a massacre. This was an atrocity. They are terrorists, etc., etc. All of that may be true. But then look at how they, they talk about Israel and their bombing campaign in Gaza where they have arguably killed a larger percentage of civilians to combatants, and also verifiably, 100%, a, a larger total amount of innocent men, women, and children. 4,500 children so far. And how do they talk about Israel's bombing of Gaza? Well, that's self-defense, right? I mean, this is just a part of war, according to John Kirby. I mean, it's, it is just such a grotesque double standard, and I think that that needs to be pointed out. So we continue here. White House. This is the best we're going to get from Joe Biden, apparently. Israel agrees to a four-hour daily humanitarian pause in the fighting in just the north of Gaza to allow civilians to flee. So let me translate that for you guys. Israel is claiming, we don't know that this has even remotely happened yet, right, that there's been any sort of, like, humanitarian pause in the bombing. I haven't seen it for sure. But what they're basically saying here is, we are going to allow for a four-hour period on some days to ethnically cleanse the Palestinians from the north of Gaza and force them south or in the ideal version from a lot of Israeli politicians that we've seen, force them into the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt, okay? So we're basically saying we're going to do a, a four-hour ethnic cleansing pause before we continue the exterminating bombing campaigns. That's what they're saying here. This is the best that we can get. And keep in mind, this is after, as I talked about just a couple days ago, as we heard from U.S. State Department officials behind the scenes, as we heard from Blinken himself, they do not want Israel to stop this invasion. They do not want Israel to stop the bombing campaign. In fact, what they said to the Israelis behind the scenes was, we need you to give us some time, okay? Because the Biden administration is feeling some of these protests, right? They're feeling the American people overwhelmingly who want a ceasefire right now, not some bullshit four-hour humanitarian pause, a fucking ceasefire. So they're feeling that pressure, and they went to the Israelis and they said, if you do some sort of like a humanitarian pause like this, it will allow us to justify it more to the American people your continued bombing campaign, and to buy you more time for this offensive into Gaza. So that's their priority. Their priority is on aiding and abetting in every single war crime that Israel is committing right now. It's not on anything humanitarian with the Palestinian people. They couldn't give less of a single solitary shit, uh, not only about the Palestinians in Gaza, or the West Bank for that matter, which is absolutely on fire right now. Over 150 Palestinians have been killed by radical terrorist settlers in the West Bank since October 7th. Okay, but they not only don't care about the Palestinians, they also don't care about the Israeli hostages. You know why? Because those Israeli hostages are currently being killed by Israel's bombing campaign. There have been multiple proposals that have been floated over the last month or so. Where they, Hamas has said, well, let's have a ceasefire. Let's, let's stop the bombing right now and we can negotiate for a hostage swap, right? We'll give you the hostages that we have here in Gaza, and Israel, you return the hostages that are being held in this administrative detention in Israel. I mean, there are hundreds if not thousands of Palestinians who have not been charged with any crime who are in Israeli prisons right now. Men, women, and children, okay? That's also hostage taking, by the way. And so there have been deals that have been floated where, okay, let's do a hostage swap. Okay, let's have some sort of a ceasefire deal that's worked out or some sort of a lasting deal into the future. Israel's rejecting that. They don't want that. They say return the hostages, 
or we're going to continue with the bombing, even if that bombing ends up killing the hostages. That's their priority. Okay, so for all of this talk about how the hostages should be the priority, the hostages need to be released, the hostages need to be freed, I agree with that. I don't want hostages to be sitting getting bombed right now in Gaza or, or to have been taken in the first place by Hamas. But if your priority was actually in getting the hostages back, you would stop the bombing. You would negotiate. You would do a prisoner swap or a hostage swap with Hamas. But they're not doing that. They're not even entertaining that prospect. And so I want to finish off here with this because I'm getting up here and maybe I'll touch on a little bit more of this uh, in another video or just show you a little bit of these other clips here. But this was a, uh, a journalist, one of the only, you know, good journalists who gets to ask direct questions from uh, two State Department officials. Right. And his name is uh, Sam Husseini. Right. And he told a Pentagon spokesperson that he and other Biden administrations could face prosecution under international law for supporting what Israel is doing right now in Gaza. Let's go ahead and listen to what he had to say here for aiding and abetting genocide war crimes and crimes against humanity under international law and may face investigation and prosecution. Do members of the State Department face similar possibilities? Again, uh, so Craig Mokhyber, who just resigned as director of the New York office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, noted that intent, usually the hardest part of genocide to prove, isn't in this case. He's, he wrote in his resignation letter, quote, explicit statements of intent by leaders in the Israeli government and military leave no room for doubt or debate. You claim that uh, you want Israel to make the distinction, but you don't seem to be making the, the, we the distinction. Absolutely if I, if I might, I didn't interrupt you. I didn't interrupt you. The Center for Constitutional Rights just put out a statement. Legal organizations put members of Congress on notice for complicity on genocide. Quote, please take note. This is a letter that they sent to members of Congress, Center for Constitutional Rights. Please take notice that should you vote in favor of that package, the Biden package for Israel, you risk facing criminal and civil liabilities for aiding and abetting genocide war crimes and crimes against humanity under international law and may face investigation and prosecution. Do members of the State Department face similar possibility. Again, uh, Sam, as I said, we have uh, the U.S. government has a, a rigorous process in place for evaluating whether something constitutes uh, genocide, and we have not made that assessment. In but this you case. continue to I'm pretend gonna, that I've, the I've bombing taken... of hospital after hospital, bakery after bakery, uh, university after university, and somehow you keep pretending that, oh, they're just after military I, people. I, I, I... He's 100 percent right. And, you know, obviously this motherfucker is not going to give him a straight answer on anything. Neither would Anthony Blinken, neither would, you know, any of these other ghouls, Miller or the rest of them. Right. But, uh, you know, credit to him for actually asking these questions. It's a legitimate question, or at least it would be more of a legitimate question if international law was something that the United States or Israel or any of our other allies actually had to abide by. Unfortunately, uh, it's not. I mean, just as a reminder, under the Bush administration, the United States actually passed a law. I think it was like referred to as the Hague Invasion Act that basically said if you tried to hold a U.S. soldier or or a commander or a, a politician accountable for our war crimes under the guise of international law, we will invade the Netherlands. That's what we said. That's what our country said. We're going to invade the Netherlands if you try to hold us accountable for our war crimes. And I think, you know, I mean, it's pretty clear. As he was just pointing out there, the intent, the genocidal intent, right, separate what's actually happening on the ground. Because some people would say, oh, you're calling it a genocide. Well, they've only killed 10,000 people. First of all, if you look at the speed, if you look at the scale of the destruction in Gaza, over half the, the homes, the residential buildings in Gaza have been destroyed, over a million people displaced. You already have over 10,000 casualties. You know, some people would look at that and they'd be like, oh, it's not that many deaths. But look at what's actually happening on the ground. But even if you, if you remove that prospect of it, look at these statements from these Israeli politicians. One was calling to nuke Gaza, okay? Others have said we should flatten it into a parking lot, which is something that U.S. politicians have also echoed and surprisingly didn't get censured. Rashida Tlaib, the only Palestinian American, gets censured, but guys who are saying we should flatten Gaza into a parking lot don't get censured, okay? We've also had guys like uh, Isaac Herzog, the president of Israel, who have outright said there's no such thing as a Palestinian civilian. We've had other guys like Yoav Gallant, the, the minister of defense, okay, who come out and call them human animals, all right? The, the genocidal intent there is very obvious. They want to flatten Gaza. They, they, we've had other uh, Israeli representatives who have come out and basically said the goal is not on precision, the goal is on destruction. Well, what does that mean? As he pointed out there, if you're bombing hospitals, okay, if you're starving the people, okay, because you're not allowing food, water, medicine, electricity, fuel, any of that into the Gaza Strip, so that's collective punishment, that's already a crime against humanity, you know, you're bombing the hospitals, the mosques, the schools, the UN shelters, people who are trying to flee to the places that you told them to flee to, residential buildings, I mean, all of these different things, then what are people supposed to conclude from that? Obviously, this has genocidal intent, and if you don't like that word, then call it something else. These are war crimes. They're brazen war crimes. It's not even it's not even up in the air whether or not these are war crimes that are being committed, but this is sort of like the waffling dance that the United States has to do. 
to support what I think at the end of the day, a lot of Americans, uh, American, you know, defense officials and State Department officials and, and military uh, members and, and high level politicians really view as like a military installation for the United States. Okay, it's not just because they love Israel or because they, they want to protect freedom and democracy in the Middle East or something like that. Obviously not. The real goal there is that Israel is a launch pad for us. Israel is, is as Nikki Haley said last night, the tip of the spear okay, in the Middle East for the United States. It's a military base. It's a military hub for us to project our power in this incredibly important and vital region where we can extract natural resources, where we can maintain geopolitical and military control. That's the real goal in, in the U.S. support for Israel. It has nothing to do with freedom or democracy or human rights or anything like that. That's the real goal at the end of the day. And so they have to do this stupid fucking dance where they can't address you know, actual laws that are being violated, right? Because then our hypocrisy would be exposed in front of the entire world. They can't address that. They have to do this pretend, oh, well, we're actually, you know, doing a rigorous process here to decide whether or not they're following in accordance with international law. It's unambiguous. It's not even remotely debatable at this point. And, you know, we have had some few politicians, guys like uh, uh, Joaquin Castro, who have come out and, and, and said, like, you know, it seems to me that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is prioritizing collective punishment over the release of the hostages. That's something I touched on earlier. I think he's 100 percent correct. And um, I think maybe I'll save this one for another video just to give you a perspective of the actually I'll show you just a little bit of this because it gives you a perspective of the uh, the scale of the destruction on the ground. So this was Channel 4 News who's actually been doing some some really good on the ground uh, reporting and analysis during this entire bombing campaign. But they, they actually got to go in and sort of, I guess, embed with some of these Israeli troops to get a picture of what they're doing in this ongoing invasion. But just look at some of the destruction here and look at the people by the thousands, if not millions at this point, or close to a million, who are being forced to flee on foot to the south. I mean, you can see entire buildings just pancaked to the ground, completely eviscerated. I mean, people just fleeing in the dozens and dozens, people being pulled from, obviously, the rubble, innocent babies and children. I mean, it's just... It is absolutely horrific what is going on right now. Another perspective here on what, you know, some Palestinians are referring to as the uh, second Nakba, which isn't even just their words. It's also words that have been used by Israeli politicians who have outright said we want to do a second Nakba. So, I mean, you have, you know, thousands and thousands of people who are being forced to flee. They say over 1.5 million people being forced to flee to the south. They say that a lot of these uh, Gaza refugees were, or a lot of these uh, Gaza residents were already refugees from the first Nakba, which is also important to point out there. And, you know, they're giving their testimony. So all of this will be down in the description below. You know, it looks like Israel, according to the words of Benjamin Netanyahu, is planning an indefinite occupation of Gaza. You know, we've seen some videos of troops who have, uh, you know, come out and said shit like this. We returned. We were expelled from here almost 20 years ago. We started this battle, divided and ended it united. We are fighting for the land of Israel. He's, he's in Gaza right now saying this. This is our land, and that is the victory to return to our lands. So listen, if the plan isn't, to just go in, wipe out the Palestinians or ethnically cleanse the Palestinians in Gaza, conquer it, and then establish that as Israeli territory, then I don't know what else the plan is. I mean, it's, it's very clear at this point, the plan is not to just go in and like remove Hamas, which is not something that I think they could even do in the first place, let alone without having any sort of plan for what happens after that. The plans that we have seen floated, like putting the Palestinian Authority, which already doesn't have legitimacy amongst Palestinians in the West Bank, putting the PA in charge of the, of the Gaza Strip as well as some sort of a governing authority, that's completely ridiculous. There's no plan for what happens, even if they did successfully remove Hamas from power. But also, they've already admitted, I mean, a lot of these Hamas leaders are in Qatar. They're not in the Gaza Strip right now. So what are you doing? You're going around, you're killing vastly disproportionate amounts of innocent men, women, and children, radicalizing people in the process. You're probably not even going to be able to exterminate Hamas because Hamas is an idea. Hamas is not a set amount of troops. And if you kill that set amount of troops, then you win the game and Gaza becomes peaceful or something like that. So there's no real legitimate plan other than just ethnic cleansing and displacement and a massacre, a revenge sort of tour for the Israeli government after what happened on October 7th. So, I mean, there's your updates there. Uh, you know, I wish I could say that I think it's going to get better. Uh, but unfortunately, I think over the next couple of weeks and months, probably, uh, it's just going to continue getting worse and worse and worse. And uh, this is going to be a situation that we are stuck with. And uh, unfortunately, obviously, the innocent Palestinians in Gaza are going to be stuck with for a long time from here. Everyone is saying good politics guy has the best politics. Believe me, no one does it like you. Believe me, everyone is saying.